evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Shangshung UK lecture series. And uh, we're going. We have tonight Stefan Mang and Peter Woods, who've completed two fantastic books so far. And I think in the email we've sent out, there is also the link to the website where you can read about their work, which we'll be hearing about tonight. I'll share it on the chat on the side. The talk will last about an hour, an hour fifteen minutes, and then we'll have some questions and answers at the end. So if you want to write some questions in the chat uh, or just keep them for the end, uh, then we'll have some time with them for answering our questions. And I won't uh, say too much about them. I'll let them introduce themselves and their work. So thank you, Stefan, and thank you, Peter, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you, Jamian. My pleasure. Uh, so Peter, say something of like who we are. <laughs> um, so uh, well, I'm I'm Peter, and that's Stefan. Um, we've both been uh, working on this project for um, some years now. Uh, we started out in Kathmandu. Uh, we were both students at Rangjung Yeshe Institute, um, which is in uh, Boda in Kathmandu, and uh, we were both studying there. And we got connected through uh, Pak Chuk Rinpoche as well as his uh, wife, his consort Kandra Norbula, um, and it was just. Uh, something that was kind of an aspiration of, of these teachers. And then we were lucky enough to be connected and there at the right time. And we were interested. Um, uh, so then we uh, have continued with this project ever, ever since. Um, Stefan, do you want to say anything more about? <laughs> no, I think that sums it up pretty well. Uh, I think we, we both have finished our degrees now. So we're back into res our respective countries. So to, so to say, or wherever we are at the moment. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're continuing to work from there in the project. And yeah, um, I heard that the majority of you are students of Nam Kai Nogo Rinpoche. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the fortune to meet uh, Rinpoche himself directly, uh, but we connected with him very much through his teachings and his books. And um, it's very interesting. Um, Rinpoche himself also showed great interest in, in pilgrimage. And uh, I particularly read one article, I think it was uh, published in the Rigzin magazine, uh, where Rinpoche spoke about Udiana and Shambhala and um, had also an exchange with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And it's, there's a very interesting connection because one of the friends of Rinpoche was. Uh, the Italian Tibetologist Giuseppe Tucci. And it was actually Tucci uh, with his sort of pioneering research um, in Tibet, but also in other places, that in Pakistan he followed uh, the great uh, practitioner and pilgrim Ogin Rinchen Pal. And he basically, through the Italian archaeological research project, I'm not sure if I said it correctly sort of rediscovered actually Udiana, uh, which is the birthplace of Guru Rinpoche and um, the, yeah, the great master Guru Rinpoche and the topic of uh, today's talk. So <clears throat> as you know, um, the topic is the pilgrimage to the sacred sites of Guru Padmasambhava. And uh, to give you a brief overview, um, I'll briefly introduce the project. Um, then I talk a little bit about who Guru Rinpoche is, um, pilgrimage within Buddhism. And then Peter will take over and guide you through sort of a visual journey um, to three sacred sites of Guru Padmasambhava in Nepal. And then we conclude our talk by giving some brief information of how you can connect with us and of course, question and answer. Okay, then um, to get started. Um, so our project started in 2014 in Nepal um, under the guidance of Nathan Scholling Rinpoche and Patrick Rinpoche and his wife Kandu Nobula. Uh, with the goal of connecting practitioner with the great sacred sites of Guru Padmasambhava. And um, the project received the name 
Nekor, which is a Tibetan word. Um, ne means place or sacred place, and kor means to circle or to circumambulate. So you could render it as circling the sacred, or in more simple terms, just pilgrimage. Yeah? And um, so for this project, um, we followed the advice of one great senior um, teacher within the Nyingma tradition called Kyapche Yangtang Rinpoche, who spent the last years of his life very much in Sikkim and then traveling all over the world and teaching and giving empowerments. And um, Rinpoche advised us to follow the Pema Katang. Um, in English, it's called uh, the Chronicles of Pema, referring here to Padmasambhava. And it's widely considered as one of the main biographies of Guru Padmasambhava. And we have taken this sort of, following the advice of Rinpoche, we have taken this as the basis for our research. And we have done, we have then um, consulted um, the works of many great upholders of the lineage of uh, Guru Padmasambhava, such as Jamin Kensu Wangpo, Jamgun Kong Rinpoche, Chokshu Deshin Lingpa. And um, we re also requested teachings from and guidance from uh, senior lamas, as well as various teachers uh, currently uh, of our generation, yeah? such as Kepche Chatter and Puchin. Uh, and we based our research mainly on these uh, traditional accounts. However, we have also consulted the works of Western scholars and academics. For example, for our first book, um, the Guru and Puchin sites in Nepal, and all the sacred sites that we explored there. We were in very close contact uh, with the great scholar uh, Hubert de Clare, um, who guided our project with a lot of care and enthusiasm. So that's just uh, now briefly uh, a little bit of background of our project. Um, yeah, it started in 2014, so there's seven years have passed. <laughs> And now uh, we're going over to um, the second point, which is who is Guru Rinpoche? Um, so Guru Rinpoche is known by many names. Um, the Tibetans refer to him um, as Pema Jungne, uh, which translates either as Padmasambhava or Padmakara in Sanskrit. And he's often lovingly referred to as Guru Rinpoche, which translates as the precious guru or the maha guru, which means the great guru. Then um, to give you a brief summary or, or overview of the life of Guru Rinpoche, um, Guru Rinpoche was, ah yeah, nice there. You see uh, an image that Peter just displayed of uh, Guru Padmasambhava on the right, and you see the Buddha on the left, yeah? Uh, we come back to that in a little bit. So then um, <clears throat> the Guru Rinpoche was already prophesied by the Buddha and their varying prophecies uh, in the sutras, um, in which the Buddha basically said that soon after he will pass away, um, somebody will uh, reappear born in a lotus and continue his work of benefiting beings. Yeah? And according to this prophecy, prophecy, some say 12 years, some say 24 years, but the numbers sometimes vary and there are different uh, explanations why. Um, Buddha Amitabha um, sent from his heart a Vajra marked with the syllable Hri, and it descended into the Lake Danakosha in Udiana. And there, uh, miraculously, the Abone Lotus flower, the Vajra transformed into Guru Rinpoche. And uh, not soon thereafter, um, Guru Rinpoche was found by King Indrabhuti, the um, king of Udiana. Um, who saw this sort of special child and um, he decided to adopt him. <laughs> so he took him home to his kingdom 
and there made him his heir. And then Guru Rinpoche continued to rule the kingdom of Uddiyana for, for a while. However, he, he felt that this life as a king is not leading to much future benefit. And he always had this urge and drive to follow the spiritual path. Um, then for some unconventional behavior, um, Guru Rinpoche managed to get sort of expelled in a way and uh, was expelled to the Chana grounds. And this is now where sort of Guru Rinpoche's spiritual journey begins. Um, the Chana ground that he was expelled to is called Sitavana. It's not too far from um, Bodh Gaya. And it's basically the heart of ancient Buddhism where uh, Guru Rinpoche's spiritual journey also begins. And Guru Rinpoche follows uh, a vast variety of teachers, both uh, human and divine. And uh, while in training, he goes through various austerities. He recently frequently roams around the Chana grounds and he appears in many different forms and guises in order to um, sort of facilitate the Dharma in India by uh, inspiring uh, people or students to become uh, Buddhist practitioners by averting threats to the Dharma and by pacifying evil spirits. And Guru Rinpoche also went extensively into retreat. Uh, for example, uh, in Nepal, in places such as the Asura Cave and Yang Le Shu. And um, it was not before long that his fame spread also to Tibet. And upon the invitation of King Chitsun Betsun, Guru Rinpoche was invited um, to Tibet. Um, there, the, the Buddhism was just being newly introduced, and there were plans on the way to build Tibet's first monastery called Samye, and they already had a great scholar invited there called uh, Abbot Shantarakshita, and it was upon the advice of Abbot Shantarakshita that um, the Tibetan king uh, sent the invitation to Guru Rinpoche, who accepted, and on his way to Tibet started binding sort of the unruly spirits of the land and um, bound them to the Dharma and established them as Dharma protectors. And um, then he helped establishing Tibet's first monastery. Uh, he invited many great translators to translate um, the Dharma into Tibetan. And he taught himself extensively um, the Dharma in Samya in various places throughout Tibet. And it's said that he blessed the entire land of Tibet with his presence. And uh, through his sort of journey through Tibet, he also hid great uh, terma treasures, um, hidden teachings um, for future generations that then were revealed by his follower, followers at the sort of destined time in the future. So um, what we see here, although it's just a brief summary, is that Guru Rinpoche is not an ordinary person. And that is also not an ordinary life story that we are usually sort of encounter or are used to. Um, and we can see that um, there's something quite uh, beyond the ordinary going on here, which is a little bit sometimes also challenging and difficult to digest. And now if we compare it um, to the Buddha's life um, and draw here a comparison between um, the Buddha and the Guru's life, um, here Peter kindly showed um, the picture again. You can see um, the Buddha in the traditional monk's dress and robes uh, seated on the left and Guru Rinpoche appearing uh, sort of quite differently with uh, already traditional Vajrayana attributes, um, such as the skull cup that he's holding in the hands and the Vajra and the Kadwanga or scepter. Yeah? So uh, if you look at the life story of the Buddha, uh, and I hope we're all familiar with the standard sort of life story of the Buddha, um, where the Buddha renounced um, the kingdom and set out on a spiritual path and um, eventually attained um, enlightenment under the uh, Bodhi tree. So this is a very sort of nice, uh, in a sense, digestible story for us. 
Um, but here it's very interesting to know that, that's, that this is actually just one of many stories of the Buddha. And the perspective of the Buddha's life story uh, shifts very much on the sources that we consult. And uh, it becomes very much apparent, for example, in the travel diaries of the great uh, Chinese pilgrim monk Xuan Sang, who in the seventh century basically traveled through the, I think for over a period of six years over the entire subcontinent of India. There's pretty much not a single place anywhere in India where there's not a story of uh, the Buddha blessing the site or being at that place in a previous life. Uh, so here we sort of the perspective shifts um, um, from sort of an ordinary person seeking to attain enlightenment to sort of a vast activity of the Buddha that is sort of simultaneously present in multiple locations. And um, here it's very interesting to see that um, while one story of the Buddha tells more the sort of perspective of one individual setting out on the spiritual path and then achieving the goal of attaining enlightenment. If we broaden sort of this uh, to the, as to include the various life stories of the Buddha and especially sort of this presence throughout the entire Indian subcontinent, then we see very much not the life story of a Buddha, but the life story of the Buddha, you know? like uh, the life story of this uh, enlightened being that goes beyond our ordinary conceptual mind. And here it's very, very interesting. Uh, the same applies to um, Guru Rinpoche, which is uh, in an ordinary sense, this life story that we just heard is just one of many life stories. And the Guru Rinpoche said very famously that depending on the capacity of uh, my disciples, I appear differently and different life stories are told. Yeah? And what we can see here very interestingly is um, that this life story in particular is not a life story of a guru, meaning a, a teacher who eventually taught the Dharma and particularly established the Dharma in Tibet, but it's more the story of the guru and how the guru manifests in our world. Yeah? So actually, um, we can talk here rather than of a person, it's more a principle, it's an enlightened force that um, sort of initiates, maintains, supports, and spreads the Dharma. And um, here the teachings actually say that the Buddha and the Guru uh, are in fact one and the same. Yeah? However, um, they appear in our world um, as two different individuals, so to say, or two different forces or principles to teach two different aspects of the path. So also, if you look at the picture, you can see that the Buddha is wearing here uh, the monk's robes. And Guru Rinpoche, as I pointed out before, is already in the Vajrayana attire. So here we see, um, two different sort of the embodiment of two different aspects of uh, the Buddhist path, yeah? And here it's very interesting to um, see that Guru Rinpoche as the Vajrayana teacher, um, he's actually the embodiment and the manifestation uh, of the Vajrayana teachings. And uh, what is a crucial point here is that as a Vajrayana teacher, um, the Guru, Guru Rinpoche did not appear to sort of reinforce uh, concepts and ideas that we have about the world um, and how a life story, for example, of an individual could look like in order for it to fit in our sort of nicer conceptual boxes. But rather, he, Guru Rinpoche appeared um, to defy and to break concepts, yeah? not to reinforce them. Yeah? So actually, the challenges that we experience by reading, for example, the Guru's life, they sort of start to question a lot our own concepts yeah? and sort of encourages us to drop them. Yeah? And there's a very 
Uh, so in this way, Guru Rinpoche becomes a bridge to lead us to, and discover what lies beyond concepts. Yeah? And here, Zongza Kensu Rinpoche in a teaching in 2015 in Kathmandu gave a very, very nice example. Um, and uh, Rinpoche basically said that uh, this, these sort of life stories can open us to the domain of the non-conceptual. Because initially, I might think, oh, you know, like this is a little bit too difficult and uh, I can't deal with that. So sort of we maybe step a little bit back. Mm. But interestingly, um, this sort of life stories encourages us to open to an horizon in our own mind of infinite possibilities. Sort of, uh, they encourage us in that moment, uh, the life stories actually not to judge them, but to experience them as they are and sort of drop our ideas. And the more we drop our ideas, the more open we become and the less concepts we have. And we sort of start to enter a realm uh, that lies beyond concepts. Yeah? And uh, here on the Buddhist path, um, the guru is very much used as the principal sort of object of the Vajrayana practice, and the students work with the guru in their own practice. Uh, for example, in the guru yoga practice or already uh, while taking refuge, um, we visualize the guru. And uh, we, we are trying here to engage into a process of opening our hearts, or in other words, the training of devotion towards the guru. And um, here in many ways, it's very interesting because the guru, um, guru Rinpoche in particular is maybe a little bit far distance. So in, in, in some ways he's also uh, perfectly pure for us, yeah? Because uh, in our ordinary minds, in our ordinary states about our personal teacher that we're directly connected to, um, we might have uh, sort of hangups and issues or we might, uh, have questions and doubts and uh, that regularly arise, yeah? So the whole training uh, with Guru Rinpoche here can be sort of, uh, doesn't have that layer, yeah? And uh, that's very interesting. And there's also the teachings often tell us to see our own teacher and Guru Rinpoche is indivisible. Mm. And the other thing is that we are encouraged here to train is to drop our concepts, to drop our preconception of how things are and how they have to be, um, all these things that are basically the barriers that our own conceptual mind created. And this dropping of concepts, it's what Vajrayana called is the training in uh, pure perception. And the other interesting point here that uh, the Vajrayana stresses over and over again is that the guru, in this case, um, Guru Rinpoche, as he appears, is in fact no other um, than an external manifestation of our own true nature. So Guru Rinpoche therefore becomes a tangible link that we can work with, a bridge. And um, by working with the Guru, we come to understand sort of our inner Guru, which is our own true nature and thus unravel the nature of our own mind. Yeah? So here um, we conclude the section on who is Guru Rinpoche and I'll uh, briefly talk about um, pilgrimage within Buddhism. Um, what is very interesting and unique to Buddhism is that pilgrimage is as old as Buddhism itself. And it was actually the Buddha, while he was still alive, who advised his disciple to go on pilgrimage. Yeah? And what the Buddha taught is um, that, and encouraged the students to go on pilgrimage to sites that represented key moments in his own life. And the idea here was that the disciple can connect and sort of to uh, also re-experience um, the key moments of the Buddha's life and get this inspiration and sort of this boost in their spiritual practice, therefore. 
And um, it was already the Buddha himself who um, identified many sacred sites through his uh, spiritual vision, you could say. For example, there's stories of the Buddha um, visiting a, a place and recognizing it as um, a site where the Buddha Kashyapa, the previous Buddha, meditated. And um, then upon the request of his disciples, he himself uh, meditates there as well. And uh, by doing so, two things are happening. One is the Buddha is leaving an imprint, a spiritual imprint. You can also call it a mark of the sacred. And secondly, he's opening the sacred site to the students yeah? through telling the history of the sacred site and by practicing there himself. So um, we have already seen that there is this sort of blessings in a site uh, that make a particular site uh, sacred, uh, but there are more features actually that can come together that make up a sacred site. Um, so if you ask the question, what is a sacred site? Um, we could answer that by saying that um, environmentally, environmental factors are coming together, such as, for example, a particular shape of a valley, minerals in the earth, a certain trees or plants growing in the area, um, a, a natural water source, a spring or a waterfall, and maybe the sunlight falling in a very particular way. And um, I think often these are also places where if we were to visit them, and I think probably we all have uh, in the forest or somewhere in the nature where our mind sort of naturally calms down, yeah? So that we can almost experience the blessings of the site already, although the site might not be necessarily identified as a spiritual site yet, yeah? Then there are further factors such as for example, the residence of a local deity or a spirit, and um, also past masters coming by, of course, <laughs> and uh, practicing at the site. Yeah? And um, whatever these circumstances may be, often it's a sort of coming together of all of them. Um, um, teacher or a master is then led by his spiritual vision and can sort of identify a particular site as particularly potent for meditation practice. And this master then practices at the site and um, open it, opens it for the practitioners so that the students in the future can receive the blessings. Yeah? And often then uh, telling about its benefits. Yeah? Um, so the site and the sacred site that we're going on pilgrimage to then can become sort of a catalyst for our own practice. Yeah? And um, when we go then on pilgrimage to such a site, um, by setting the right motivation, by leaving sort of our homeland behind our house and sort of our ordinary samsaric life, um, we're starting to create um, a sacred atmosphere uh, in which we can sort of transform our being and receive the blessings, yeah? uh, which actually means to discover our own true nature. And here it's very interestingly, um, the Buddha said this very famously to his disciple uh, Vakali. And the Buddha stated, he who sees the Dharma, Vakali, sees me. He who sees me, sees the Dharma. Seeing the Dharma, he sees me. Seeing me, he sees the Dharma. And um, what is very interesting here is that the Buddha, uh, in, with this quote, shows how an external seeing, um, um, such as of the sacred site or Guru Padmasambhava that we're working with, for example, in our visualization, or it may be a statue or something, um, can lead us and can be the bridge to the internal seeing. Yeah? Um, so, um, here you can draw this parallel between this quotation and going on pilgrimage as well as working or practicing with the guru. And here we can see how sort of all these external factors um, that we see, that we experience, that we engage with 
uh, can sort of spark this internal seeing and understanding, which eventually um, leads to a realization of our own true nature, uh, which is the goal of the entire Buddhist path. And um, here, um, approaching the guru, as well as going on pilgrimage, are two sorry, <laughs> very powerful methods that can help us to discover uh, the nature of our own minds. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, my part is concluded. And now I'm handing you over to Peter. Thank you uh, so much, Stefan, for that really beautiful um, introduction to, uh, to pilgrimage, to Guru Rinpoche. Um, uh, with that kind of in mind, uh, we thought it would be useful to, to now actually virtually imaginatively go to some of these sites and, and bring out uh, practically almost how this process of, of interacting with physical sites, which are in a sense, the imprints, like you said, Stefan, of the Buddha, um, these imprints, these physical traces, how going to these places today, knowing the stories, knowing what happened there, knowing the activities that took place, um, can allow us to develop this, this pure perception, um, to allow, allow us to drop our concepts and go beyond just what we're seeing and be able to see the guru in the site. And in that sense, um, transform, uh, just a trip in, into pilgrimage, into a kind of guru yoga. So let me share this. We'll start our journey um, at the Jarung Kashor Stupa of Boda, which is probably one of the most recognizable Guru Rinpoche sites, or at least just sites in general, whether you know it's Guru Rinpoche uh, or not connected to this site, this is um, the liberation upon seeing stupa of Boda. And if any of you have been to Nepal before or have just dreamed of going to Nepal, this is probably an image you've seen. Um, so a big part of this project for us as students, practitioners, translators, just people interested in learning more about Guru Rinpoche and learning more about these places, um, the process involved going into the life stories of the guru and going to these places and learning to connect these stories to the places. So the first kind of the first place we started on our journey uh, was actually this uh, stupa, the stupa of Boda, the Jarun Kashur stupa. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just kind of take you through this story and the story of two other places. So we'll go through three sites and, um, and kind of see this um, through the eyes of a pilgrim, see this through the eyes of someone who's going to this place, which you may, may never have been before, may hope to go to or not, but uh, maybe after this you will. Um, see it with the eyes of a pilgrim, see it with the eyes of someone witnessing this place and coming into contact with um, this physical trace of, of the guru. Um, so uh, the, first, the first book in our series of Guru Rinpoche, uh, Life Stories and Sacred Places starts in Nepal. And the reason for that is because this stupa actually uh, is connected to the guru in a, in a past life, in a time long before the guru was born. Uh, into the world in the way that Stefan beautifully described. Um, uh, the uh, stupa itself actually um, embodies the aspirations of a uh, poor poultry woman, a woman who kept chickens, a poor woman who, um, as we learn in these, in these stories, there's actually a treasure that was revealed that tells this story very beautifully. Um, that uh, she had she had been actually the daughter of Indra, and she had misbehaved, and due to that misbehavior, she was born uh, as a poor lady. But she had a lot of faith. She kept that faith, and she um, worked very hard. Um, she had uh, children, four different uh, boys uh, born to four different 
uh, born from four different men, um, and that she had to raise herself. And she worked very hard and she was able to uh, educate them, to, to set them up in life. Um, and with the extra money she had left over, she had this aspiration and she wished to create a representation of the Buddha's, uh, 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 the Buddha's mind, a stupa. Um, and the story goes that after she collected all this money, she goes to the king of Nepal. She requests to build the stupa. And the king is so overwhelmed by her pure intention, despite being this poor lady, that he said, okay, go ahead. Um, and little did he know she was going to build something uh, that is as grand as we see today. Uh, but as she is building it, and as her sons are helping her build it, the locals uh, start to talk amongst themselves. How could this poor lady um, kind of show us up? How could she embarrass us with this incredibly magnificent project? All the kind of aristocracy, all the kind of high class people are like, how, how can we let her do this? Embarrass us in this way. So they go to the king and they ask her, ask him, excuse me, um, how, please, please, oh king, please stop the building. It's going to embarrass all of us. And uh, the king thinks to himself for a moment and being a king, his word is, is bond. And uh, he can only reply um, in the Tibetan, it's Jarung Ka Shor, uh, quote, let it be done, slipped from my tongue. So he gave the permission, let it be done. He gave the permission, Jarun, Kashwar slipped from his mouth. He said, let it be done to the lady. He can't go back on his word. So the building would proceed. And so all the people kind of go back grumbling, but she um, continues to build with the help of her sons. Unfortunately, she, unfortunately she, she dies in the process. And her dying wish is that her sons conclude the building of this stupa, the fulfillment of her aspirations. Um, and the sons agree. So without the mother and with the help of some, you know, locals, um, they're able to actually complete the building of this stupa in something like three years. Um, the climax of this story occurs as they have completed the stupa, they're consecrating the stupa. And as they consecrate the purity of the mother's motivation, the purity of their own motivation um, evokes the Buddhas of all the directions. They come and they're casting flowers over the stupa. Lights are filling the sky. Uh, music is filling the air. Sweet smells are wafting throughout the whole area. And the Buddhas come and they say to the sons, whatever aspiration you make in front of this stupa will be fulfilled. So what do they do? So the oldest makes an aspiration. He makes an aspiration and says, uh, may I in the future be a king who can uphold the Dharma in the North, in a place where there's no Dharma now, may I spread that Dharma, spread the light of the Dharma and uphold that. The second brother uh, goes up and says, well, what should I do? Uh, and he says, well, the king is going to need a, a preceptor, an abbot, someone who can be the head of the monks, head of the sangha there in that kingdom. So may I be that abbot, that uh, preceptor to uphold the, uh, the monastic lineage. The next brother, the third, goes up and says, well, they've got a, they've got a king, they've got an abbot. They're really going to need a tantric master. They're going to need someone who can dispel the obstacles, who can deal with the uh, sometimes powerful forces that might be against the Dharma. May I be that tantric master? And then the fourth uh, comes up and says, well, I'll be the one, may I be the one in the future to connect all of these three together. May I be the one to go out, a royal messenger to go out, an emissary to go out and find these three and bring them together so that this aspiration can be fulfilled. And that's exactly what happens. So in a future life, the first brother is reborn as the uh, king of Tibet, Tri Songditsen, who made the aspiration to spread the Dharma, to found Samye Monastery. Um, 
and the second brother who wished to be the abbot is, is Kempo uh, Bodhisattva or Shantarakshita, the great scholar of uh, Nalanda Monastery who was invited first by the king to help found the Dharma there. And uh, this story is often told in the context of, uh, of a future time in which um, the king had been trying to build the monastery and Shantarakshita had been invited to Tibet and they had faced all kinds of obstacles in building Samye, uh, this first monastery in Tibet. And there was all these forces, human and non-human who were preventing the building. And uh, Shantarakshita being the incredible master he was, maybe he could have, in fact, he could have done it himself, but he was aware of this prophecy. And so he told the king, he said to the king, in a past life, you know, we were these brothers and basically tells the entire story and says, our third brother needs to join us. We need to invite Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava. He's the tantric master and he's in India now. We must go invite him, send an emissary. And they send, of course, the one who was the fourth brother in the past life to go find Guru Rinpoche. And this is what allowed the Dharma to finally be uh, 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 established in Tibet. Samyam Monastery was eventually built. The Dharma could spread. And so when we look at this place, when we go to the Jarankasha Supra of Bodha, we're seeing so many layers of, of uh, you can say narrative or history, uh, but it's really the combined aspirations of an entire people, of the Tibetan people to spread the Dharma in Tibet. Um, of the activities of Guru Rinpoche, of allowing that to happen, um, and of this incredible story of these uh, aspirations being fulfilled. And in this same treasure teaching story of the stupa, uh, we learn of the incredible benefits because not only can this fulfill the aspiration of those sons and all the time long ago, but of pilgrims who go there today. Um, and we can see in part of the research, we were able to find more stories related to the stupa. We could see that masters... Um, in later times, after the time of Guru Rinpoche, uh, went there and incredible things happened. If you look at this image of the stupa and you look to the left, there's a base, there's three kind of uh, steps to the foundation. If you look to the left of the lowest step of that foundation, uh, there's a white stupa behind the prayer flags. That area is especially blessed. That's an area where... Um, uh, for instance, uh, in the uh, life story of Jigme Lingpa, of Riggs and Jigme Lingpa, you, you learn of, uh, of him traveling to that spot, that, uh, that very place at the stupa and receiving from Dakinis these crystal balls, which he swallows. And, and from there arise the Longchen Yintik revelation, the, uh, the, this incredibly famous uh, treasure re uh, revelation happening right there a kind of aspiration being fulfilled. And then the stupa itself um, being the uh, 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 reliquary holding the ashes of the great uh, master Rangrik Repa who um, had the aspiration at the end of his life to, uh, to essentially do a kind of chulen practice in which certain parts of his body would become blessings, his tongue, his eyes, his heart. And those have been enshrined in that stupa there. Um, so I'm just mentioning this as a fellow pilgrim and as someone who uh, has spent time at this site. And I think a, such a huge part of this uh, project and, and part of pilgrimage in general is just connecting with these stories and um, seeing pilgrimage as a kind of sadhana practice in which uh, we're drawn into the mandala of these stories of these activities of Guru Rinpoche, yes, but also um, the past life of King Trisong Detson, the past life of Shantarakshita, you're drawn into the life of, of Longchenpa, you're drawn into the life of this master you might not have heard of before, Rangri Grepa, um, and so many others who are there daily making these aspirations. So, so much of pilgrimage is, in a sense, uh, being drawn into this mandal of stories and activity and uh, and actually going there and making your own aspirations, you're in a sense um, 
taking on taking taking the place of Guru Rinpoche, making those aspirations and all those others who have made aspirations there in the past. So let's, um, with that, let's move on to another site. And so we've gone from kind of the most, we're going from the most sort of well-known site to uh, maybe one of the most, uh, let me just say what, another very treasured site in the life of Guru Rinpoche. And let's see if I can change the slide. That is uh, Asura Cave in Yang Lishu. So, In the life story of Guru Rinpoche, many activities take place. Stefan gave you a very short uh, introduction. Um, and part of his uh, a journey after his training, after going to the charnel grounds, and I should mention um, here that Nepal itself is considered one of the charnel grounds, these eight sacred sites that are blessed by various uh, dakinis, and each site has its own features. Um, and Grimshay goes to these sites, practices, tames the, the haughty forces and teaches the Dakinis. And um, he actually goes to Nepal earlier in his life, as it is also considered one of these eight great charnel grounds known as Hundrup Tsek, um, of which um, the central stupa of that charnel ground is in fact the Bodhana stupa, um, or has been identified as the Bodhana stupa. So um, we're staying in the region of Nepal now. And um, this is at a later point in which Guru Rinpoche has realized the time had come to attain yet another uh, level of uh, realization. Um, and he uh, had been traveling throughout India, taming all kinds of stories. And at, at a certain point, he says the time had come to uh, realize what is known as the Vidyadra level of Mahamudra, which is... Uh, essentially uh, a point at which the practitioner becomes inseparable from the Yidam deity in which not only is their mind ripened into the deity, um, but their entire body, their entire form, all elements of their, of their being becomes one with uh, their, their Yidam deity. So Guru Mishay travels to Nepal to, to do just this. And again, as Stefan nicely said, um, Guru Mache is uh, a personage, but very much a principle who displays for us the tantric path, who uh, in his life, he's displaying what any practitioner uh, might go through and should go through. And he's showing us in a sense, the various practices and he's accomplishing those practices. And the amazing thing is that he's doing this, not just in a, in a, story time place, but in actual physical places that we can touch and go to. So um, the guru's journey to this Asura cave in Yangla should to do this practice takes him to Nepal, takes him to the famous Swayambhuna stupa first. The Swayambhu stupa is another of these very, very famous stupas in the Kathmandu Valley. He goes there and part of his Yidam practice is to have a suitable partner in the practice, a consort. And there, uh, near the Swayambhu Stupa, the stories tell that he um, <clears throat> comes to a charnel ground in which he finds an abandoned uh, princess, actually. She had been abandoned at birth um, due to her mother's uh, death, actually. Um, and she had been raised in this charnel ground right, right near the Swayambhu Stupa. And Guru she finds her and sees that she has all the marks of a, of a dakini, of a, of a proper consort. And, uh, she, and he teaches her and takes her on as a student and then as a, as a partner in practice. And together, they leave the Kathmandu Valley and they go just outside to a place known today as Parping, um, a place you can get to fairly easily from um, anywhere in Kathmandu um, in, the, in the Southwest um, out of the valley. And as you leave the valley and enter kind of a more wild place, uh, you find uh, a Sura cave in Yang Lishu. And the story goes that Guru Mishé with Sha uh, Shakya Devi, uh, they begin practicing the, the Yidam practice um, in the lower cave of Yang Lishu generally. It's understood. So if you look at these pictures here, um, on the top right, you can see 
what it looks like today, the lower cave of Yang Le Shu. So this is understood as the place. So it's the top right picture and also the, the bottom right picture. So that's the lower cave. Um, and at these places, it said that uh, they practiced for three years, um, the practice of Yang Dak Haruka or Vajra Haruka, um, this very, very profound wrathful practice. Um, and in doing this, uh, we get the famous uh, phrase in the life stories, the more profound the practice, the more you could say profound or uh, <laughs> maybe more difficult, the, uh, the obstacles. So all kinds of obstacles arose, not just for them, but for uh, the entire country of Nepal. So their practice was uh, affecting everyone. There, there was drought, there was famine, uh, people were suffering. And so what Guru Mishri did is he sent off two of his uh, close disciples uh, to India, to uh, one of his former teachers there in India named Prabhahasti. And uh, he sent them to get a very special practice known as Vajrakalaya. And uh, they, they go, the, these two students, one's name is, uh, there's various ways to say the names, but we'll just go with Jinamitra and, uh, and Kunla Kushi. So these two, uh, two disciples, they go to India and they ask Prabhahasti, can you please provide the practice that can help uh, Padmasambhava and his concert Shaki Devi with, um, with their sadhana. And they come back laden with texts, like elephant loads of these Vajrakalaya texts and commentaries and, uh, and bring them back uh, to Nepal. And it said just having these texts enter Nepal started to quell some of the, uh, the drought, the famine. Um, once they arrived, they offered these texts to Guru Mishe and Shakya Devi. They came up to uh, what is known as the Asura Cave. So if you look at these pictures, on the top left, you can see the outer um, area outside of the cave, um, around which today there is a three-year uh, retreat facility built. Um, uh, but in the past, you can just imagine that cave there. And, and the central image on the top um, is actually inside the cave. Very, quite small space. Um, and together they go into that space and after three years of practicing below, they practice above for three weeks. Um, that's all it takes. And uh, Grimshay combines the practice of Vajrakalaya with Yang Da Karuga. And uh, he famously says that, uh, that while Yang Da Karuga is like the, the rich merchant, uh, Vajrakalaya is like the guardian, the bodyguard. So he combines these two together and uh, they together reach accomplishment in this uh, Vidyadra level of Mahamudra. They become indivisible from the Yidam deity. Um, now, this is an amazing uh, story, but as you can see, this is a place that is still very much um, used, uh, cared for by the tradition. Um, if you look, again, that top left image and the bottom central image, those are two different views of this uh, monastery that was developed by Tukul Organ Rinpoche in the 20th century. Um, there had not been much there before, and he developed this knowing uh, the connection to the story of, uh, of Padmasambhava and his accomplishment there. It said um, in the older pilgrimage guides, it said I um, that... Uh, that while Bodh Gaya is the place for, for uh, the Buddha, the Buddha's enlightenment took place in Bodh Gaya, for tantric practitioners, for followers of Guru Rinpoche, uh, Asura Cave and Yang Lashe are the, are the Bodh Gaya, are the place of the, the great accomplishment of the Guru. Um, so Tukur Rinpoche, uh, obviously knowing this, cared for the place, built these facilities, and um, and Another kind of uh, layer to this, apart from, uh, as I was saying before, there's this narrative, and then there's uh, these kind of more recent narratives, which help connect us as pilgrimage, help see why these places are so special. Um, one of the kind of more recent stories, if you look on the bottom left, you see a handprint, and often when you go there today, they'll say that's a handprint of Gurimbashe, 
But uh, according to uh, Tukul Oregon Rinpoche, this was in fact the handprint of a, of a student from a few hundred years ago who went to this cave on pilgrimage knowing it was connected to Padmasambhava and his accomplishment of Mahamudra. And he went there to practice Yangda Karuka and Vajrakalaya together. Um, and I should point out that's one of the big um, uh, sort of benefits of going on pilgrimage, knowing these stories, because these places are blessed by these masters. Um, it's said that our accomplishments will be quicker. And especially if you go to a place where Gurumbashi practice Vajrakalaya, Yangda Karuka, and you yourself, you see yourself as a practitioner of that wish to practice, that you can go to these places and you can kind of connect. The place itself allows a connection between you as a present practitioner and that past in the form of what's called blessings usually. So uh, in any case, this practitioner from a few hundred years ago, let's say, uh, he went to this place to practice these practices, Yandaka Ruka Vajrakalaya, and he gained accomplishment to a degree in which he uh, left a handprint in the, in the rock just outside the cave. And in fact, if you look at the central top image, you look, there's a Gurumbashe statue on the left, on the right, those are two images, one of Vajrakalaya, one of Yang Dakaruga, that was made by this same practitioner who left the, the handprint. Then coming up even to the 20th century, if you look at this uh, sacred set, you have, uh, for instance, uh, you have the account of, of Tugu or Gurumbashe giving uh, uh, empowerment to the 16th Karmapa within this very cave. Um, and uh, it was said that Tulgor Yambashe was very reluctant um, to do so. So it was just him and the Sitchin Karmapa, and they go in there, uh, you know, uh, just the just them two. And uh, Sitchin Karmapa had been really requesting Tulgor Yambashe to, to provide him an empowerment. And uh, after relenting, Tulgor Yambashe is giving. And it's said that at that point, nectar started to drop from the, the roof of the cave and actually fell on the head of the 16th Karmapa as part of the blessing of the empowerment. Um, and then a third sort of modern story of this place, you've got uh, in the 90s, uh, Kempo uh, uh, Jigme Punsok, who was one of these great revitalizers of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in, uh, in Tibet and um, in the 80s especially, he is the founder of Larungar, which has grown hugely, and there's been many stories in the media about um, <clears throat> the, the delicate dance and sometimes heavy-handedness of the Chinese government in, um, uh, in tearing down some of these incredible encampments of monks and nuns who just wish to kind of practice the Dharma in a community. So there's this incredible place, Larungar, founded by Kempo Jigme Punsok, and he had he'd been there for years and eventually he wanted later in his life in the 90s to, um, to, uh, to meet the Dalai Lama. And so on his trip from Tibet to India, he stops here. And uh, there's actually a very uh, beautiful song that he wrote down. I think it was transcribed by Kempo Sardargi, one of his students, um, that describes his experience here. And as part of this kind of incredible experience he had coming to this place, this pure perception he had where he saw it as the mandala of uh, Vajrakalai, he saw it as um, this uh, still kind of vibrant mandala that the, that the guru Padmasambhava had blessed this place as. And he realized that in the past, he was in fact a uh, Jinamitra. He was one of these two students of the guru who had gone to India and brought back the Vajrakalaya scriptures. And in remembering his um, his identity as this student, he goes into the cave and he pulls out a Kalaya dagger. And he also reveals a Terma text from this cave in the 1990s. And on his trip to India, he goes, he offers the Vajra Kalaya text and the, the, the Purba dagger to the Dalai Lama. Um, so you can see that these places, while um, some of these narratives sometimes see far off, through the pure perception of, of present day masters, they're kept sort of alive. And you can see that the treasure tradition, all of that uh, is maintained in these places and uh, treasures are still being discovered in these places. So um, as practitioners, we go there, um, knowing these things, we can also allow ourselves to drop some concepts and actually see this, not just as any old cave, but as a place where these incredible things can happen and will happen 
um, if we practice in, in the same way, if we follow in the guru's footsteps. So um, let's move on to what is probably the, uh, which is the most maybe uh, obscure of the three sites, uh, which is known as Abihara. And uh, this is a place that's mentioned in biographies, mentioned in various places. Um, and uh, it is, you can probably say it's part of what, what we can call the further adventures of Guru Padmasambhava. Uh, they're sort of main points of the life story, but this is something that um, in terms of the story, uh, the story connected to it is, is not in, even in the, the Chronicles of Padma, uh, Chronicles of Pema, the Pema Katang. It's in a, another uh, related text known as the Hladre Katang, or the Chronicles of the Gods and Demons. And it involves a lot of sort of further adventures, other stories of the guru taming demons and spirits here and there, and usually focused in Nepal because it said that on the way from India to Tibet, he's taming the various uh, forces of the land. Um, so as part of that uh, series of stories, we were able to uh, sort of uncover, find this uh, beautiful narrative of the guru. Um, and it's related to uh, Avihara. Um, but the story starts with Shaki Devi and uh, uh, the disciple Kunla Kushi, who is kind of a sister of Shaki Devi, was also one of the disciples joined by Jinnah Major to go to India. And uh, Shaki Devi and Kunla Kushi are uh, one day picking flowers in the forest to offer at the temples. They're going to go to Avihara, they're going to go to other temples and, uh, and offer them. And as they're in the forest, Kunla Kushi sort of wanders off and she uh, comes upon a beautiful pond. And from the pond emerges this, this beautiful prince um, who's shining on his horse. And he comes up to Kunla Kushi and he says, will you, will you come with me and be my queen? Come back to my kingdom. And she's sort of awestruck and she says, yes, yes, yes. You know, uh, completely forgets about offering to the Buddhist, completely forgets her Dharma path and goes with this, um, this spirit who had emerged. In fact, he was a Naga and he brings her back to the kingdom. And this choice leads to a whole series of uh, disastrous circumstances in which um, she's drawn into all kinds of battles and fights and eventually ends up in a hellish cauldron. Um, and her parents, meanwhile, are distraught. Their daughter's missing. What do they do? And it's at Avihara, the Gurumbashe is able to console them and say, I will uh, save your, your daughter. The time has come for her to repent, essentially, to confess. <laughs> and he goes and travels and basically teaches her methods for purification. Um, and eventually she purifies and she's brought back. And so uh, this is a story often connected with Avihara, this temple, which is located in, in Patan, in southern Kathmandu. And it's a place that, uh, uh, you know, it's said that many uh, great tantric masters practiced there, studied there, taught there, but it wasn't quite uh, certain, uh, at least it's not clear to us that it was certain um, until the 20th century when we have the great master Kepche Shato Rinpoche, who is traveling through Kathmandu, he's in Nepal at the time, and he comes upon this uh, vihara, this, uh, this temple in, in Patan, and not the most famous of temples, uh, there's other more famous temples, but he comes upon it and through his pure perception, he's able to see that this is in fact a vihara. Uh, this is in fact um, uh, the site of these incredible stories. So after that, you've got, um, once this recognition takes place, you've got other Tibetan masters going, visiting, and uh, encouraging and basically sharing this story with the local Newar community, and they're pleased um, to have this connection. And uh, they receive support from these Tibetan Lamas. And if you look on the top right of this picture, you see a new Guru Bashe shrine built there actually at this Newar Buddhist temple, um, which especially after the earthquake, um, the recent earthquake in, in 2014, uh, the, uh, you know, the place was in, in shambles. There wasn't a lot of money to help. And, um, and, and through this connection to the guru, to these stories, they received support and they were able to build this incredible guru uh, temple, which now the Newari community there is um, actively maintaining. They're doing pujas on Gurumbashe Day. 
um, regularly and it's a place for, for pilgrims. So it's, uh, it's kind of amazing really to see how these stories and how the pure perception of the, of the masters are able to uh, locate, rediscover these places and actually create these vibrant communities of local practitioners and revitalize the Newar Buddhist community in this particular place. Um, I would just mention here, I think it would be uh, 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 wrong not to mention Yeshit Sogyal because she plays a big part in these stories. And uh, the large image you see here on the left is actually uh, right near Avihara. It's at the charnel ground, just, just below Avihara. And um, reading the life stories of Yeshit Sogyal, uh, which is part of this project, it's not just the guru, but it's his consorts, it's his disciples. And his consorts were, her, were his, um, his most uh, close, closest and most trusted disciples. Um, we learned that Yeshit Sogyal uh, actually uh, came to Nepal also. She blessed a lot of these sites also following in her guru's footsteps. So um, uh, basically she was sent to Nepal by Guru Rinpoche saying, you need to find your consort in practice. And she goes to Nepal and the first place she goes is the Bodhana Stupa where she makes aspirations, makes offerings. And from there she goes in search and she eventually finds her consort um, as a actually a servant to a wealthy household in, in Kathmandu in a place called Bhaktapur. And uh, they say, well, you can't just take our servant, you need to pay us. <laughs> and she didn't have any money at the time. And so she's going around and she eventually comes upon this charnel ground near Avihara, where she finds a, uh, a boy, uh, actually just a corpse of a boy and parents distraught. And she, out of her compassion, she says, you know, I can, I can help you. And she is able to summon the life force of the boy back into the corpse, back into the, bo uh, the boy's body and uh, revive him, resurrect him. And uh, the parents are incredibly overjoyed, as you can imagine, and they offer all this gold. And from that connection, she's able to go and uh, uh, buy the freedom of Acharya Sale, who's the servant. And together, they eventually return to Nepal and they practice and they gain accomplishment and lineages are um, founded. So um, this overview really I, I just gave of these stories that kind of concludes our journey this is to give you this sense of of the connections between a physical place today between the life of the guru and between how understanding these stories can really connect us and allow us to develop a pure perception in which these places aren't merely ordinary but are actually integral in the advent of of the, the Vajrayana teachings in Tibet and now throughout the entire world. Um, but also they connect to our own practice because these are places where um, these blessings, where this event still somehow subsides or, or still, still resides within, the, uh, within the, uh, the place itself. And as practitioners, we can go there knowing the stories and in a sense do a kind of guru yoga in which we're dropping our concepts and we're seeing these places as marks of the guru and his uh, consorts and disciples. So with that, I'll conclude. Um, maybe I went a little long, I'm sorry if I did. Um, um, I would just mention here at the conclusion. So thank you guys all for, for listening to Stefan and I um, go on. Um, I, just, I would just conclude with a few words about our project and mention, I have to mention the books following in your footsteps. Um, today, mostly I drew on the stories from the Lotus Born Guru in Nepal, which was our first. We recently released uh, Lotus Born Guru in India. Uh, both of these books are on Amazon. And uh, uh, in the process, the next step is the Lotus Born Guru in Tibet, which, as you can imagine, would be the, the biggest uh, project to undertake. So um, you can learn more about us on, on NACOR.org, which I think you guys um, uh, received information on in, in the email from Jamyang. Um, we can also, we're also happy to share, uh, some more resources through Jamyang related to the life story. For instance, a very good life story, a very nice summary from Jungle and Control, which is available on lotsawahouse.org. Um, uh, and Stefan, did I mention nacor.org? Do you want to mention nacor.org? Uh, yeah, we have a website, nacor.org. Uh, 
like the title of our project, where you can explore the sacred sites of Guru Padmasambhava. And we have by now also extended the project and there uh, we have included the sites of um, the Buddha and many more sacred sites are yet to come. And how the books go together with the uh, website is that the books do not include sort of uh, practical information of how to get to the site and where things are uh, because it's sort of subject to change. Um, so the practical information has been moved to the website for um, accompanying the Guru and Puja books. Uh, for the sites of the Buddhas, actually both is together. So there won't be a book on the Buddha, there's just the Buddha on the site, uh, on our website. Additionally, also um, we have launched an app that is also called Nekor, which is both available for iOS and Android devices, and you can download it. It has the same information in our website, but it's maybe handy to have it and uh, still a bit in development process. So uh, maybe it has still one or two hiccups, which we are currently still fixing. And um, yeah, uh, we also offer guided tours, at least we used to, but then COVID hit and uh, we had to cancel that. Um, so we hope to reassume that when the situation has become a little bit more stable, um, then it's open to everybody and we would be guiding uh, students to those sacred sites. And um, finally, yeah, um, we're part uh, of what is called Lase Lotsava, um, which is the sort of scriptural site of Pachogrim Puch's activity and uh, all these sort of translation projects, etc., they all fall under the umbrella of what is called Lase Lotsava mm -hmm. and all the publications. Um, yeah, and uh, if you like to support our project, you can follow us uh, on the website, uh, also through social media on Facebook on the Lase Lotsava website. And uh, there's also a page where you can uh, give donations if you like. <laughs> And these donations, they all be used to uh, continue the research on these sacred sites, uh, also used to maintain the sacred sites and um, also to allow making space and uh, for people to go and retreat there, as well as to support practitioners uh, who don't have so much financial aids um, that they can go and retreat in sacred places. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's it. With that, we can conclude. <laughs> And uh, if you have some questions, Peter and I are happy to answer them, if they're not too difficult. <laughs> Don't be shy, do ask some is questions. Is it in the chat yeah. or just yeah, whatever, whatever is more easy for you? I'm curious whether anyone here has actually been to any of these sites before. Um, whether people in the audience, if you guys have been to Nepal, if you've been to Boda, have you been to uh, Yang Le Shu, um, or to any Guru Rinpoche sites at all? I'm I'm, I'm kind of curious. You can write in the chat or something if you want. Yeah, I've been to a place. <clears throat> Um, shall I talk about um, in Bhutan? Oh, yeah. Um, I've been to Kujilakang in uh, central uh, Bumtang Valley, in the, sec the uh, first temple of three on the site. On the second floor, there's a full-size body print of uh, Gurimshe who's gone back into rock, about mm. three meters, and it's like a big eye shaped um, mm. in the rock, eye shaped in the rock, and they put perspex in front, and it's blue uh, painting with golden... Um, sort of lines coming up from where you can see where his hat and his head was in the rock. So he's basically uh, opened up all his chakras and melted the rock. And um, the uh, the Lama I went around with, um, he's like a younger Lama, this is like um, 1999, so it's 20 years ago. And he said that there's uh, 100 full-size body prints in Bhutan and over a thousand uh, where he's made his body smaller. Hmm. So the, he attained the Chalopoa Chempo, which is the deathless wisdom body. And he's still alive in uh, what is now um, the border of um, 
Venezuela and um, uh, Guyana in South America. Oh, that's the, interesting. On, on top of the uh, the me messes there, and um, so Namka um, Nobudimche, that's what he uh, went to Venezuela, and uh, he he uh, knew of this place, and he's passed now. And Sogiremche, uh, he was also uh, of that view, and there's various books on it. Mm -hmm. But um, it was um, it's Gurum Pamasambhava and Vimilamitra who who attain attained the deathless wisdom body in that lineage, which is the Longchen Yintik lineage. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, yeah, it's a sort of a extraordinary um, a thing when you are confronted with something that's more extraordinary than the Great Pyramid or the Wall of China is the the melting of rock by an individual. I mean, it's like um. Uh, it's extraordinary because um, it, it you just did not look like it'd been carved. And this is not something that, you know, there'll be no, uh, this is a long time ago, hundreds, uh, you know, whenever it was, 750 AD, wasn't it, that uh, roughly that Kulimshi arrived in Tibet. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so when you, when you see an uh, ancient temple and, you know, people, they only opened it between four and five in the morning. So I managed to barge my way in. <laughs> prostrate for the because I do the nondra in uh, to the um not to the guru but to the rig pit inside which is what prostration is about it's not uh it's not idolatry mm. uh, because your buddha nature is as good as any buddha's buddha nature so um it's like um just an exercise really mm. awareness but yeah I've been there and I've been to the uh the caves where uh, Mandarava and Guru Mshay practiced there's one cave in particular um Forget now, I was in India some time ago, a long time ago. But yeah, um, I think it's uh, Maratika. Maratika, in, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to Maratika, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so it's like a, it's an extraordinary uh, you know, thing to visit the uh, Himalayas, and and it does increase faith, you know, to see the uh, possibility of um, practice. Because I think with Tantra, um, proper Tantra, that's encased by rock, so that you don't have the uh, microwave neuralgic margins from storms interfering with your Meisner field, then uh, you can, act with a consort, you can create the uh, superfluity, superfluidity of energy that is able to remove um, uh, the DNA accretions, black goo, basically. And that's what liberation is, is liberation from discursive thoughts which are not one's own that somehow come with the dna that one is born with um <clears throat> that's what i actually do I actually sell boxes which cold melt this m state gold from the dna and destroy parasites in the process but it's, it's about being free of uh, parasites and being able to uh, enter back to the original organic state of of one's dna it's so interesting, uh, Lewis, hearing you speak about this because um, I, I totally can relate to this notion that uh, going to the physical places themselves, you see the rocks, you see the rocks must have melted somehow, you know, yeah. and our understandings obviously of science and, and all these things, we, we can expand upon what that might mean in terms of the physical interaction between our atomic structures or, you know, there's all kinds of ways to conceptualize, yeah. you know, but, uh, but the physical imprints of a body and as you say, throughout Boom Tong, throughout uh, Boom Tong, but also throughout Bhutan and throughout the Himalayas, you'll find these places where you'll find actual physical imprints, and it's hard to deny uh, just the volume, the sheer volume of these. Um, I want to ask, actually ask Stefan because there's a lot of discussion, and I think you bring up the the good point that kind of the end of the journey for Gurumbeshe, it's there there actually is no end. The uh, is consistently present because he's attained this. Uh, Vajra body, just as the Lamitra has, and he's still uh, residing in um, what's usually called Sangdo Pari or the Copper Colored Mountain. And uh, it's interesting to think about where that might be physically. And the place you mentioned, I hadn't heard of that before. I think it's very interesting. I, you know, I've heard also Iris Rock in in Australia, um, but I wanted to ask Stefan. Stefan, have you have you heard Sangdo Pari in? Uh, in uh, Venezuela before, because there's a mention of Sogyal Rinpoche. Uh, 
Thank you. No, I haven't actually. <laughs> I heard various other explanations, but I haven't heard this one. It's very interesting. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, just to not to distract, but one thing is uh, in the chat, I saw that uh, uh, Lydia asked a question mm. about the sources for prophecies of uh, Guru Padma Sambhava. Um, can you clarify that? What does it mean? Uh, prophecies here? Do you mean about the future or um, prophecies about the coming of the Guru? Uh, yeah. Hello? Yes? Yeah, can you hear me? No, it's just uh, we heard, we are hearing sometimes, you know, like his prophecy that, the, you know, when the iron horse uh, uh, will fly and, uh, uh, sorry, and uh, ironico will fly and, uh, you know, the on the wheels, the, the horses, so on. So it's like the all the, the, the West, uh, you know, the teachings will come to the West, to the, uh, to the red men and so on. And, uh, you know, like this kind of prophetic, uh, prophetic future. Uh, sources where where they can be located like like not just as a you know like something which is easy to find on uh, just a few words on 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 the internet but where can you exactly like kind of locate them um, did you hear about any prophecies like regarding not just karmapa but uh, or uh, any other figures in future but how they relate to the to the common to the common world you know, to the to our future that to the, like a purpose and uh, you know the the fate in a way um both both yes and no i would say <laughs> um i've heard of these prophecies that you mentioned as well and uh guru Rinpoche gave many prophecies um often connected to the teachings that he taught um for example um, the text that Peter mentioned in the beginning of um, uh, the Bodha Stupa and its history of the Jaron Kashar Stupa, which is translated and which you can find online uh, on Lotsava House. Uh, there's also a section, Peter just shared it, thank you. There's also a section there where Guru Mpucha, uh does give a prophecy and similar prophecies you will also find in other uh, Guru Rinpoche related uh, texts. And um, yeah, they're not necessarily prophecies about our current uh, time and age, yeah? mm -hmm. but they might be varying prophecies. What is very interesting here is how in this particular prophecy uh, on the Jaran Kasha Stupa is how um, Guru Rinpoche speaks about the decline of the Dharma, uh, in particular also in, in Tibet. And this becomes very resonant when you read it now with, mm -hmm. for example, uh, the destruction of the monasteries that underwent uh, in Tibet. Um, so, but it's hard to place those prophecies uh, for which time they are exactly, and um, they're often then also decipher deciphered by, for example, our current generation of teachers that then refer back to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But w which tertiary it would you would you like uh, apply to it? Which tertiary in the future? Which ling lingpa? Because they, you know, like also that about the hidden lands as well. They had he, he, he given the clues to his uh, to his students or you know to the to the later teachers like some reincarnations. So there were the link past the Tertons who who also place all this. But it's, it's it's a long story anyway. To maybe for the next time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I I will I will look on your website and uh, I may read about it uh, when I have more time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. I lived in Nepal in the nineties and I was registered at True One University where I I did a PhD. You may have seen my PhD in the form of a book. It's called Tantric Healing in the Kathmandu Valley, it's, mm. um, published by Pilgrims. Anyway, um, yeah, what I'm interested in in your talk is the fact that, of course, I know, you know, most of these places uh, of pilgrimage that you talked about, Boda, Asura Caves. But the thing I didn't, um, you know, recollect was the Evihara. Uh, can you just explain why is it that the Ivihara is so relatively 
you know, less known than the, you know, obviously Bodha Stupa and the Asura caves. Yeah, I, I can I can respond to that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's a place that's really been rediscovered um, as a Vihara only within the last decades. Let's say the second half of the 20th century. It's with Shacho Rinpoche going there, mm -hmm. um, you know, after leaving Tibet and going through the Kathmandu Valley. He was in residence in Parping for mm -hmm. uh, the end part of his life. And uh, and it was his it was his recognition of this uh, uh, temple in Patan, and okay. then from there was the most recent, and that's why it's less known mm. because it's so recent. And uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the guru's life story, it doesn't figure as largely, so it hasn't been as sort of uh, widely uh, visited. Um, you know, in the past times, people would love to go, of course, to the Bodhana Stupa. Everyone knew that. Everyone knew the. Uh, 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 Yang Lishu Asura Cave that was connected to the Kampuchea yeah. Mahodra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of like a, a bit player that was only recently uh, uh, recognized. I see. And whereabouts in Patan is it exactly? Uh, you go, uh, if you know where the uh, Golden Temple is, the yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Hiryana Bihar, um, you go just, just south. You walk just south of that. You come to a bathing uh, pond. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you're walking south, you then take a right. And it's maybe 10, 15 minutes walk just south okay. of there, southwest. Okay. Uh, mm. And has it yeah. been um, well preserved? I mean, it didn't get damaged in the earthquake? It did get damaged, um, not catastrophically, but it's being uh, rebuilt. Um, and uh, uh, one of the advantages of, of its recognition as Avihara is just the fact that there's attention to the place and care for the place not only from the Newar community, um, but also uh, uh, present day masters. For instance, uh, Pakcha Grimbache is one of them uh, who uh, has uh, helped sort of uh, basically restore the place and build these shrines. Um, if you go to our website, nacor.org, you can actually okay. find an article on Avihara with maps and also directions mm. on actually how to get to these places. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Oh, and- uh, It's just been put in the chat. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. One one interesting uh, thing I wanted to add to Evihar, which is very uh, nice, which you can see sort of in the historical pro progression. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, the sites of uh, Guru Rinpoche are also treasures in itself mm. um, that were sort of lay hidden sometimes for many generations. And um, for example, even in India, when you read now the India volume. Um, the book <laughs> or go on the website, you will see a limited number of sites. Yeah? These are, on the one hand, they're selected because they're the main sites, but on the other hand, um, other sites are not yet discovered yet. Um, often, I mean, for the Guru Rinpoche sites, it's usually a master who's guided by not only the biographies, it's not something that you can just like, like you won't find many geographical uh, hints of where Asura cave, for example, is. Yeah? So mm. you can't read in the biography of Guru Padmasambhava and then locate Asura cave. So it was at some point also discovered by um, a Terten who has been guided by visions of Guru Rinpoche and then he revealed it. And so similarly, mm. more recent examples is, for example, Evihara. And there's even a more recent one as well in India, which is uh, Kukutapada, which is not too far from Budgaya, uh, which is where Guru Rinpoche met uh, one of his teachers called Prabhahasti. Um, so these are more recent examples, and there are more to there. There are sort of more to come. There's actually just right now, or in the more recent times, uh, one teacher, which the name I can't remember, is discovering sites in uh, Ladakh and opening them. Uh, mm. So it's, it's, it's really also an ongoing, um, you know, it's, it hasn't stopped at some point and then that was it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> I'm you. curious to know, since Bhutan was mentioned, if you're planning volume four, maybe about Bhutan eventually. Um, so with Nepal uh, and India, as you will notice, 
It has just the title India doesn't mean we're not talking about the political borders of India. We're talking about greater India, uh, which of course includes other sites. So, so for us, it was even like there's, you will find, for example, the channel ground in Afghanistan or something. Um, this is sort of the aspect of the life. So with Tibet, it will be the same. Uh, we will we will not consider Tibet by former or present sort of political borders. So we, we will more consider the Himalayan region in itself, and it does include um, Bhutan. However, um, okay. there's, there's a great challenge here, in fact, which is that in Tibet, of course, uh, the sacred sites are extremely vast to the point you could almost say infinite. <laughs> So our research uh, and our book will focus on sort of the main sites, which so because we have to draw a line and sure. um, these main sites will mainly focus on the five or eight great caves. Um, one of which is in Bhutan, it's called Zengetzong, but it's, I think nowadays very difficult to visit. Yeah? Future sites related in, um, and then we have to see, and we'll again discuss with um, some teachers which other sites to include. These five or eight caves that will definitely be in there. Uh, but of course, there are many, many sites in Bhutan as well as in Greater Tibet. And we will slowly share these uh, through the website in a probably a little bit more essential form. Yeah. Uh, yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? If we don't, then I'd like to thank you both so much. And really, I highly recommend exploring this website, Nekora. And there's so much on the website. And I've had the good fortune of getting the first book, volume one of Power, which I love. And I'm very much looking forward to reading the second and third one. And so thank you for your fantastic work. Really, it's excellent. And it's a great thank you. service. Oh, one small sort of goodie which you will find on the website is that we have a we had an artist painting the sacred sites and uh the 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 as well as in the book the paintings are featured and we we're now with particularly with the india volume went to feature the sacred sites as they were at the time of guru padma sambhava so oh. there's paintings you can travel back in time and hopefully that also inspires uh <laughs> your practice okay great yeah. question what was the name of the artist that's doing the paintings um it's an artist in delhi that we know a tibetan called um Gyurmila. not mm -hmm. a not a of i think he's not wildly widely known <laughs> Okay, great. Then thank you so much, both of you, thank and you. thank everybody for attending.